Welcome back, everyone, to the last episode of Zenotes Live Chemistry with Fahad. Today, he'll be talking and explaining about an A2 topic called buffer solutions. So let's try, jump right in, shall we? All right. Hello, everyone. So uh, today, another uh, topic that uh, puzzles a lot of students. Uh, this is part of the A2 chemistry syllabus, buffer solutions. And it's basically part of the wider topic on uh, equilibrium and uh, especially with regards to uh, pH calculations. So first of all, we'll define what a buffer solution is, followed by pH calculations regarding these buffer solutions. So let's get right into it with a deep dive. So buffer solution, basically the simple definition, and you will be asked a lot about this, you just need to remember, it's a solution that does not change its pH significantly when small amounts of acid or base are added, right? So if you add a small amount of base or a small amount of acid to a buffer solution, its pH will not change, right? So that's the interesting thing about buffer solutions. And uh, this is the definition you need to be clear about because it's asked a lot, right? So buffer solutions normally are used where an almost constant pH is needed, right? And we will see one very interesting use of a buffer solution um, later in this lesson. So buffer solution, it can be made using either a weak acid and its salt. So we will look at that first, followed by a weak base and its conjugate acid, which is another word for salt of a weak base, right? So an example of a weak acid and its salt forming a buffer solution is a mixture of ethanoic acid and sodium ethanoate, right? Now we know that ethanoic acid is a weak acid, right? And uh, we looked at this uh, whole discussion in our lecture on pH curves, right? So over here is your acid and it is in equilibrium with its conjugate base. Remember a conjugate base is what is left once an acid has behaved as an acid and donated a proton, right? Mm -hmm. Now these two species are in equilibrium with each other. And the reason why this is a weak acid, ethanoic acid, because the position of equilibrium stays to the left, right? Mm -hmm. You have more undissociated molecules than the dissociated ions, right? Only a few of the molecules will actually break up to give you hydrogen ions and the conjugate base ions that we have seen over here, okay? Now, you have a relatively large number of acid molecules because of the fact that the acid is weak. But if you have sodium ethanoate along with the ethanoic acid, what happens is this is a soluble salt. It will dissolve in water to give you ethanoate ions and sodium ions. So you will have a relatively large uh, concentration or large number of the conjugate base as well, which is coming from the salt. And you have a large number of undissociated acid molecules. So there are two important things here. The undissociated weak acid molecules and the conjugate base ions that result from the weak acid, right? The weak acid itself does not contribute much to the concentration of conjugate base, but most of the conjugate base comes from the salt, that is, part of the mixture, okay? So these two things are important and we will see just how in controlling the pH of a buffer solution. So over here, if I add a small amount of acid or hydrogen ions, then out of these two species, it's going to be the conjugate base. It's the conjugate base that reacts with the hydrogen ions, right? So what will happen then is the equilibrium, the equilibrium position will shift, right? So basically over here, the hydrogen ions are part of the equilibrium as well. So when you add H plus ions, the concentration increases, right? And to counter this increase in concentration, according to Le Chatelier's principle, the equilibrium must shift to the left. And that shift to the left occurs when the conjugate base reacts with the increased concentration of hydrogen ions. And so uh, due to this equilibrium shift, you get more undissociated molecules and less 
conjugate base ions, right? So basically what is happening is that uh, the equilibrium will shift such that the concentration of hydrogen ions is brought back down and the number of conjugate base ions and the number of undissociated molecules does not really change because you have a relatively large number of both, right? The undissociated molecules coming from the weak acid and the conjugate base ions coming from the salt, right? The equilibrium position shifting is not changing their concentrations by much, right? So the pH is relatively constant and the composition of the solution is also relatively constant, right? So that's how a buffer solution works by resisting changes to pH, right? So the next case is if I add a small amount of base or hydroxide ions. Now what will happen is the H plus ions will react with hydrogen ions. So the H plus ions will react with the hydroxide ions and they will form H2O, right? So the concentration of H plus, this will go down, right? Mm. And according to Le Chatelier's principle then, where will the equilibrium position shift? It will shift to the right-hand side to bring back the concentration of H plus mm. to its original level, right? So the resistance to the pH change is there, right? And again, because we have a large amount of undissociated acid and conjugate base ions, so this equilibrium shift will not impact the number of molecules or number of conjugate base ions that much. And so the composition remains relatively the same and the pH also remains the same. So this is how buffer solutions work. Right, now this uh, buffer solution with the weak acid and its salt, this is in the acidic pH range, right? Because of the weak acid. But there are also buffer solutions that uh, can be formed with a weak base and its salt. Mm. So one example is ammonia and ammonium chloride, right? So ammonia we know is a weak base. It is in equilibrium with its ions over here. And uh, the position of this equilibrium is to the left. You have a high concentration of uh, NH3 molecules that have not become ions, right? So you have a relatively large number of base molecules and you have the salt that uh, completely dissociates to give you ions. And so this over here, this NH4 positive, this is the conjugate acid. Remember, conjugate acid is what is left after the base has accepted a proton, mm. right? So you have a large concentration of ammonium ions, the conjugate acid coming from the salt. And you have a large concentration of the base molecules coming from the weak base that does not dissociate it to ions that easily, right? So this is the um, mixture of a weak base and its salt. So now how to calculate the pH of buffer solutions? Now for this, there's one concept that you need to revise. It is of Ka, the acid dissociation constant. Right? Basically, if you have a weak acid, HA, right? It partially dissociates into hydrogen ions and the associated anion, A negative, right? The equilibrium constant for this would be this guy over here, right? It's same as how you calculate Kc, right? But for weak acids. Now, this is a weak monobasic acid. Another word for this is monoprotic which basically means that each acid molecule is capable of donating one proton, right? So that is the Ka expression or the acid dissociation constant. This is the acid dissociation constant. It's basically the Kc for weak acids. And uh, this will be used to calculate the pH of buffer solutions. And uh, remember, you will only be asked about the pH of acidic buffer solutions, right? A buffer solution that is at the acidic pH range, right? And you will need to use this acid dissociation constant. So over here, basically what happens is that uh, the concentration of the undissociated acid molecules will be the concentration of the acid itself, 
right? So this term over here, concentration of HA, is the concentration of the undissociated acid. And so if they ask you about uh, calculating the pH of a weak acid, let's say ethanoic acid again, right? And they say that uh, you have one mole per cubic decimeter concentration of ethanoic acid. So that concentration of the acid that is given is the concentration of the undissociated molecules, right? Right, yeah. Then A negative over here is the conjugate base of HA, right? And this comes from the salt, remember, right? The A negative, this comes from the salt. Because the acid does not dissociate much, so most of the uh, conjugate base comes from the salt. So the concentration of the salt will be the same as the concentration of the conjugate base, right? So this over here, A negative, comes from the concentration of the salt, right? Ka is a constant that will be given to you for a weak acid. Concentration of HA will be given as the concentration of the weak acid itself. Concentration of A negative will be given as the concentration of the salt that contains this anion, right? You just plug these in and then you find the concentration of hydrogen ions, right? You use this formula to find concentration of hydrogen ions and then you plug this into the formula for pH pH is simply the negative log of concentration of H plus, right? In mm -hmm. case you don't know what this is, this is basically the logarithm function, log to the base 10, right? If you look at your calculator, there will be a log button, right? A simple log button. There are two log buttons, right? So there's LOG log and there is LN, mm -hmm. natural log, right? You will use the LOG log button in your calculator, right? Because that's log to the base 10. In other words, what this is asking is, by how much will I raise 10 to the power of to get this value in the brackets after log, right? So for example, if I say log of 100, basically this is asking us, what is the power to which I raise the base 10 to get 100? And the answer is two, right? So this is a yeah. brief, uh, you know, definition of the logarithm function in case you're not familiar with it, okay? Now, uses of buffer solutions. Now we will use the formulas that we just covered in the workout, right? But one very important use of a buffer solution is actually in your blood, right? Maintaining blood pH is very important. The reason is that uh, you have enzymes in your body, right? that work at an optimum pH and an optimum temperature, if you change that by even a little bit, the enzymes become denatured. They do not perform their functions, right? Um, especially the function of digestion, okay? So maintaining blood pH is very important, right? I mean, if you eat or drink something or if something is injected into your body that is, um, you know, has a slightly higher or lower pH, the buffer solution in your blood ensures that the pH does not go out of whack, right? So for example, over here, we have carbonic acid. This is the same acid that goes into your fizzy drinks. This is found in your blood as well. And it's a weak acid. It is in equilibrium with hydrogen ions and these uh, hydrogen carbonate ions, right? So we have an acid, the weak acid and the conjugate base. So if I add a small amount of acid, then what happens is the concentration of acid goes up and equilibrium needs to be shifted to the left-hand side to bring this back down, right? And so because you have a high concentration of undissociated carbonic acid and a high concentration of the hydrogen carbonate anion that comes from the salt, that is mixed with the weak acid, the composition will remain relatively the same and the pH will be brought back to um, the regular pH of blood, right? And in the case of uh, base, right? OH negative ions, obviously the H plus will react with it. And so the concentration of H plus will go down. So you need to shift equilibrium to the right hand side to bring it back up. And so the pH is stabilized. And because you have a high concentration of weak acid and the salt, 
in the buffer solution. So shifting equilibrium will not change their concentrations by much. And so the buffer solution resists the change to pH while maintaining its composition, right? So this is the use of a buffer solution in human blood, right? And if pH uh, was not that stable at around a neutral pH, you could die. Simple as that, right? And so this is basically a very important use of buffer solutions. There are other uh, important uses as well. Uh, one use that um, you will study further in A2 when you study organic mm -hmm. chemistry, in the separation of amino acids, right? You need to use a buffer solution to do that. But that's a topic for another day. So this was all yeah. for our deep dive. So I hope you're ready for the workout, all right? So first question, define what is meant by the term buffer solution. Now, this is very simple. This question comes up a lot. It is usually of two marks, paper four, right? So the two points that you need to mention are that, um, you know, this solution basically resists changes to pH, right? And when does it resist change to pH? When a small amount of acid or base is added. So remember, if you add too much acid or base, then even the buffer solution can't resist the change in pH, right? When a small amount of acid or base is added, that is when it resists the change to pH. Now, another type of question that comes up a lot is write two equations to show how a solution containing a mixture of, uh, now in this case, we have nitrous acid, HNO2, and sodium nitrite, NaNO2. So how does this act as a buffer, mm -hmm. right? Now, simple solution to this is the undissociated acid molecule of HNO2 is going to react with the small amount of base that you add. So over here, I have HNO2. If I add a small amount of base, which is OH negative, this is going to react and you're going to get H2O and you're going to get the nitrite ion and NO2 negative. So this is one way in which it resists the change to pH when a small amount of base is added. Now, if I add a small amount of acid, right? Basically H plus, then what happens is the conjugate base the conjugate base of uh, nitrous acid will react and you're going to get HNO2, yeah. right? So basically you need to show the reaction of the weak acid with the hydroxide ions and the reaction of the conjugate base with hydrogen ions, right? So both are going to be simple yeah. acid-base reactions. The, uh, this is how you show the behavior of a buffer, right? So, now, the next is um, asking for the acid dissociation constant AA for ammonium ions. Now, ammonium ions, we first need to write the equation. Ammonium ions, they dissociate and you get ammonia and the H plus that it donates, right? NH4 positive is, remember, it is a weak acid, right? So if I want to write the Kc for this, then I would have concentration of hydrogen ions times concentration of NH3 divided by concentration of the weak acid itself, which is NH4 positive, right? So this is your acid dissociation constant expression. Write two equations to describe how a solution containing ammonium ions and ammonia can act as a buffer, again, the ammonium ion over here is the acid, right? So this acid is going to react with the base. A small amount of base OH negative that is added. So this is going to be NH3 plus H2O. Simple as that. And the ammonia NH3 is your base. This is going to react with the small amount of acid that you add. It's going to form NH4 positive. So basically the acidic species in the buffer solution will react with the base 
at the basic species of the buffer solution will react with the acid that is added. So you just need to remember that when defining the behavior of a buffer solution, right? So now on to some calculations. Now over here it says the numerical value of the acid dissociation constant Ka for ammonium ions is 5.6 into 10 to the negative 10th, right? So now a buffer solution was prepared by adding some ammonia, which is in excess, by the way, to some hydrochloric acid. So over here, first of all, first things first, we write the equation. Ammonia reacting with hydrochloric acid. This is going to give us ammonium chloride. Yeah. Now the thing is, the ammonium ion the buffer solution over here basically will consist of ammonia, which is the leftover, the excess ammonia, and the ammonium ions coming from the ammonium chloride, that is the salt, right? So you have a weak base and its salt that are forming a buffer solution, right? So now we have NH3, and uh, we basically have a volume of 0 0.8 cubic decimeters and a concentration of 0 0.25 moles per cubic decimeter. So to find the number of moles of ammonia, you need to multiply the volume with the concentration. So moles equals concentration times volume. In this case, concentration is 0 0.25, volume is 0 0.8. So this turns out to be um, 0 0.8. Two moles, right? HCl. Now I can do the same for this again. Concentration times volume. So concentration over here is zero point two, given, and volume is also zero point two. It's just the unit has changed. So this is going to be zero point zero four moles. Uh, now already they have told us that ammonia is in excess, right? And these number of moles it shows, right? Because the ratio between ammonia and HCl is one ratio one. So if I have 0 0.04 moles of HCl, it will react with the same number of moles of ammonia. But you have more than that. So that's the excess. So leftover moles of ammonia is what I need now. This is going to be 0 0.2, that's the total minus 0 0.04, that's the number of moles of ammonia that would have reacted with the given moles of HCl according to the one-to-one -one ratio given in the equation. So this is 0 0.16 moles. And now that I have moles of the base, now I need the moles of the salt, right? Now, yeah. HCl is your limiting reactant, right? So moles of HCl will dictate moles of ammonium chloride. And again, they're both in a one-to-one -one ratio. So moles of ammonium chloride will be the same as moles of HCl, which will be 0 0.04. So now you have moles of base yeah. and moles of the salt. Now you need concentrations, right? You need concentrations. And uh, the thing is, the total volume of both the solutions of ammonia and HCl that we added was 0 0.8 of ammonia plus 0 0.2 of hydrochloric acid. So total volume is actually going to be 0 0.8 plus 0 0.2. So that's one cubic decimeter. So basically the moles, if you divide by one cubic decimeter, you get the concentration. So you can use the same values, right? Now remember the Ka expression that we did in the previous part? over here, this guy. So if I write this down again, I have concentration of H plus times concentration of ammonia divided by concentration of NH4 positive. Right, so over here, I'm going to plug in the concentration of ammonia over here and the concentration of the ammonium over here because this is the same as the concentration of the salt. And remember I'm plugging in the moles directly because the total volume is one cubic decimeter. So values are the same. It's just a change of units. Ka is already given to you, which is 
5.6 into 10 to the power of negative 10. All you need to do is rearrange this to find concentration of H plus, concentration of H plus. So this over here turns out to be 1.4 into 10 to the power of negative 10. 1.4 into 10 to the power of negative 10 moles per cubic decimeter. And I will plug this in in the pH formula. So negative log of this answer that I just got. Uh, this will give us a pH of 9.85. So this is all the working that goes into finding the pH of a buffer solution. And uh, basically, um, this is the kind of question that you could get. And uh, because it's a long process, uh, people do tend to trip up, unfortunately, when it comes to this kind of question, all right? But this is the simple step-by-step -step process. And this was for a buffer solution in the basic pH range because this was a weak base and it's salt. So the pH is greater than seven. Now let's do a question for a buffer solution formed from a weak acid and it's salt. Right? So first things first, it says that bromic one acid, HOBr, is a weak acid. It's Ka is 2 into 10 to the negative ninth. Right. Calculate the pH of 0 0.2 mole per cubic decimeter HOBr. Right. So this is a simple calculation for a weak acid. Right. So HOBr, we show its equilibrium with its ions, H positive, and OBr negative. So Ka over here will be the Kc for this particular equilibrium. So concentration of H plus times concentration of OBr negative divided by concentration of HOBr. Now over here, the Ka is given, which is 2 into 10 to the power of negative 9. Concentration of HOBr is also given, which is 0 0.2 over here. Remember, when they give you the concentration of a weak acid, it automatically means concentration of the undissociated molecules, right? Because there's a lot of them compared to the ions, right? Now, the next thing is concentration of H plus and concentration of the anion. Now, the thing is that this is not a buffer solution. This is just a weak acid. You haven't added a salt yet. So, once a HOBr molecule dissociates, it will give you one H plus and one anion. So both of them are going to be in the same concentration, but it's just the weak acid. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace this term in the numerator by a simple concentration of H plus squared because it's concentration of H plus times concentration of the anion, which is the same as concentration of H plus. So these two are multiplied with each other. So it gets concentration of H plus squared, right? Once I do all of this concentration of H plus, uh, after rearranging and everything, it comes out to be 4 into 10 to the power of negative 10 moles per cubic decimeter. And once I plug this into the formula of pH, this is negative log of 4 into 10 to the power of negative 10. This turns out to be 4.7. So we have a pH of 4.7 right here. And uh, by the way, um, when you're doing calculations, it is very important to keep track of significant figures. The number of significant figures in your final answer has to be the same or just one more significant figure than the significant figures given to you in your data. So in this case, the Ka is to two significant figures, right? And so is the concentration, also two significant figures. So that is the lowest number of significant figures available to you in your data given in the question. So the answer should also be to two significant figures at the very least. You could have one more significant figure, that's not a problem, but no less than two in this case. Right. All right. So next question. All right. So now we are reacting 
potassium hydroxide with HOBr, right? And uh, again, whenever there's a reaction, always write the equation. So KOH plus HOBr. So this H at this OH will react to give you H2O, right? And this will then give you KOBr as your salt, right? So this is the equation. Now over here, notice you haven't been told which of these reactants is in excess and which is the limiting. You have to find that out yourself. So what you do is again, moles equals concentration times volume. Concentration of KOH is 0 0.2. So that's 0 0.2 moles per cubic decimeter times the volume, which is five cubic centimeters, right? Now, remember that we need to divide this by 1000 because the volume is in cubic centimeters. We need to convert that into cubic decimeters first. So this will be divided by 1000. So this turns out to be one into 10 to the power of negative three moles per cubic decimeter. And in the case of HOBr, again, moles equals concentration times volume. Concentration that is given to us is 0 0.2. So that's 0 0.2 times the volume is 20, 20 cubic centimeters. And again, remember to divide by 1000 because the volume is in cubic centimeters. We need to convert that into cubic decimeters. So this will become, if I am not mistaken, this will become four into 10 to the power of negative three moles. Okay. So four into 10 to the power of negative three moles, right? So looking at this equation, Ethan, could you yeah. tell me which of these two would be in excess? What do you think? Hmm. Uh, let me see. Uh, wouldn't it be the KOA? Wait, okay, no, so um, the AH, HOBR. HOBR, yes, that is in excess. The KOH is the limiting reactant. Yeah. Because they have a one-to-one -one ratio. You can see that, right? Yeah, yeah. So if I have one into 10 to the power negative three moles of KOH, I would want the HOBR to be of the same number of moles, but we have more than that, right? Yeah. So this is your limiting reactant. And so based on the moles of KOH, we will get moles of the salt, right? Yeah. So again, KOH and KOBR. We get, KOH one, we get one times 10 to the power of negative three. Exactly. Oh. So this is one to one molar ratio. So moles of KOBR will also be one into 10 to the power of negative three moles, right? Mm -hmm. So, oh, by the way, one, one thing that uh, hopefully did not confuse anybody is this should be moles. This is not mole per cubic decimeter. Okay, yeah, I just saw that. <laughs> yeah, apologies for that. That was the incorrect unit. We're talking about moles here, okay? So moles. Now, HOBr over here, we need to find the leftover moles of HOBr. Because we are talking about a weak acid and its salt, right? We have found the moles of salt using the limiting reactant. We need to find the moles of acid that are left over after this reaction. So basically we have moles that we had at the start. From this, you subtract the moles that were expected to react with the KOH, that's the limiting reactor. Because they're in a one-to-one -one ratio, one into 10 to the power negative three moles will react, the rest will be extra. So this will be three into 10 to the power of negative three moles of HOBr, right? Now, the next thing is that uh, you need to convert these moles into concentrations, right? The total volume of this mixture is actually five cubic centimeters from the KOH plus 20 cubic centimeters from the HOBr. So this is going to be five plus 20. So that's 25 cubic centimeters. Right? And because we need to find concentrations in moles per cubic decimeter, 
this will turn out to be um, 25 divided by 1000 cubic decimeters. So now I need to co uh, convert it to concentration. So concentration of HOBr will be 3 into 10 to the power of negative 3 divided by 25 into 10 to the power of negative 3. These 10 to the power of negative 3s cancel. And so you will get 0 0.12 mole per cubic decimeter over here. Hmm. And for KOBr, um, so let me just write this over here. Concentration of KOBr will be 1 into 10 to the power of negative 3 divided by the total volume, which is 25 into 10 to the power of negative 3. Cancel the 10 to the power of negative 3s, and you're going to get 0 0.04 moles per cubic decimeter. So you have got the concentration of KOBr, which is this, and the concentration of HOBr, which is this. And now, finally, you will plug this into the Ka expression. Remember the Ka expression is concentration of H plus divided by concentration of the conjugate base divided by concentration of the undissociated molecules. So this will be 0 0.04, the concentration of the salt. This will be 0 0.12, concentration of the acid that we just found. Ka over here, um, from the previous part, this was 2 into 10 to the power of negative 9. So this is 2 into 10 to the power of negative 9. So you find the concentration of H plus by rearranging. This turns out to be, this turns out to be 6 into 10 to the power of negative 9 moles per cubic decimeter. And so the pH is the negative log of this value that I just found, and this turns out to be 8.22, right? Now over here, uh, the least number of significant figures in the data is two, right? The volume and the concentration over here, these are two significant figures, right? And this volume over here is three significant figures. Uh, this concentration is two. So I can write this as 8.2, right? So this is our final answer. And uh, this is basically the type of question that you can expect in your exam regarding the calculation of the pH of a buffer solution, right? You need to be strong in your balancing of chemical equations, molar calculations, limiting and excess reactant. And finally, of course, the concept of acid dissociation constant and pH, right? So there's a lot going on over here and this helps students revise their previous concepts on moles as well by doing calculations of buffer solutions. Um, this is the kind of question that people usually get stuck at, right? But uh, I've tried to explain everything in a stepwise manner. So hopefully concept is clear now, right? So this was it about uh, buffer solutions. And uh, I really enjoyed making these videos with Z-Notes, right? Yeah. And, um, um, you know, just uh, one last thing that uh, do subscribe to Z-Notes, right? Yeah. And, uh, you will also find the link to my own channel, Concrete Chemistry by Fahad Ansari, in the description. So do visit that as well if you want to see more yeah. videos on chemistry. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for explaining buffer solutions to us all. Um, it was very informative. Uh, anyways, uh, thanks for joining us in teaching some tricky topics in chemistry, and I'm sure it was helpful for many. And okay, um, as yeah, as Fahad said before, um, if you want to see similar content, check out his check out his channel, which is um, Conco Chemistry, and it will be linked in the description when this uploads. And if if you would like to, we could do a second season probably like sometime if you're available. All right, sure, why not? Yeah, yeah, perhaps in my, we, we could do it like maybe like closer to November, when, November to the November examinations. Yeah, definitely. We could do that. Yep. Uh, well, until then, um, see you later. Bye. Right. Bye.